Okay. It says recording started. Okay. Roberto, do you want to already start sharing your slide because your first slide is my yeah. intro slide? Is it past? Is it forty-five past already? Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for joining this, um, I guess, very first session um, of the language show. Um, it's given by our team of um, four talks and our names and our affiliations are here. Uh, we met through a funded um, series called um, Growing Up Bilingual, showing that name researchers and practitioners synergies. And so we are four sets of practitioners and um, academics from there. Um, growing up bilingual myths, facts, and things in between is basically what you're going to hear about. So without much ado, I'm going to pass to our first speaker, Roberto. Thank you very much, Virginia. And, uh, you know, I need to share some screens, some slides for you this morning. And my presentation will be about getting the message right on bilingualism. And um, specifically, I will address some issues, some open issues on cognitive development and multilingual education. Now, let's start with some quotes that I found when I started uh, my, uh, well, my professional uh, academic research on bilingual education and bilingual development. And these are some of the uh, statements that I found when I started. Uh, let's see the first one here. Uh, the simultaneous learning of two languages produces a mental retardation, which impedes the learning of other subjects. And there was a, a, a scientific uh, article published on uh, educational research a few years ago. But even nowadays, from these kind of beliefs, uh, I can see in my professional activity that there are still perplexities on bilingual education. And this is what uh, a, a parent told me in, not long ago. My child's teacher said that raising my child bilingual would significantly delay his linguistic and cognitive development. She strongly discouraged me and my husband to speak two languages at home. A third statement that I witnessed, uh, it was by a professor in child language acquisition who delivered a talk to uh, primary school teachers. And this person said, children who are acquiring English as a second language, even coming from advantaged backgrounds, will take between five to seven years to become competent academically with the language. So the question is, is that true? And some open issues nowadays that I can find in my professional practice is that some teachers really discourage parents or carers to raise their children as multilinguals. And many parents are still concerned that learning a second language can delay significantly their children's cognitive development, but also the linguistic development. And the parents are even more concerned in the presence of developmental and language disorders, like autism or dyslexia. So what is the scientific evidence for all this? Let's start with bilingualism and cognitive development. And here I have to say quite clearly that there is no evidence that raising children in bilingual environments is detrimental for their cognitive development. On the contrary, actually, there is a large body of evidence that really shows that multilingual acquisition may actually be beneficial for cognitive development. It's like taking the brain to the gym every day and this workout will improve eventually uh, some crucial cognitive uh, skills. And really, 
there's, there is also some research showing that uh, this training of the brain may protect uh, our cognitive skills even when we age. Uh, and, and some studies show that it may delay the onset of Alzheimer's and dyslexia by four or five years. Um, what about bilingualism and atypical development? Well, even in this case, there is no evidence that raising a child in the presence of developmental disorders will cause more developmental issues. Actually, there might be some positive effects, especially on the social and linguistic development of children, for example, children with autism. And there are uh, new interesting findings that we found, uh, me and my collaborators from my laboratory, the Multilanguage and Cognition Lab at UCL, uh, we found that uh, there are positive effects of bilingual upbringing, especially in the population that are um, at more disadvantaged, like asylum seekers or uh, low socioeconomic status uh, uh, pupils and young adults. And these findings that now we are uh, trying to intensify, we, we are really opening new lines of research on the matter, uh, because these findings may be particularly important to develop uh, uh, intervention at school, uh, especially in areas with high levels of immigration. Um, let's now address the question that uh, uh, bilingualism can be. Uh, uh, challenging for education. And here there is a wrong perception uh, generally that children with English as an additional language, uh, uh, they are labeled EAL in our education system in, in the UK, they have poor school attainment. Well, but a recent report, it doesn't really show that. Uh, on the contrary, EAL pupils, they, they have identical attainment uh, in the national average. And there are, they are, according to this report, they are more likely to achieve the English baccalaureate than native speaker of English. And here there is a reference. This is a very, very uh, uh, rigorous report uh, that is showing that <laughs> clearly, uh, even, in, even children who uh, learn English a bit later in life, they eventually catch up and they achieve good attainment at school. So the takeaway message that I would like to, uh, to transmit, to convey to you this morning is that there is no scientific evidence that multilingualism delays cognitive development and school attainment. So actually, there is evidence that bilingual upbringing uh, may be beneficial, especially uh, to disadvantaged children. <clears throat> so, in order to uh, dissipate this misleading information that, as you can see, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of my presentation, is still there within educators and parents, I think it's very important that uh, scientists engage with parents and establish uh, collaborations uh, with educators. This is crucial in order to really understand uh, uh, the real issues and, uh, and, and also uh, uh, have interventions in order to help bilingual children. Uh, and for this reason, we uh, belong to an international network called Bilingualist Matters, led by Professor Antonella Sorace in Edinburgh. And we uh, created a few years ago, we established uh, a, a branch also in London with the aim to, uh, to uh, collaborate with educators and parents and to inform them uh, uh, regarding uh, bilingual uh, matters. This is our uh, uh, link. And as you can see, the branch in London is a consortium uh, uh, com consisting of different institutions. And uh, uh, you know, you can, uh, with this link, you can also see what are our events. We organize very uh, frequently events with parents and educators 
And this is one that I wanted to mention this morning is a seminar series called Multilingualism and Diversity Impact for Education, Health and Society. And this is a knowledge exchange seminar uh, open to everybody and free of charge. So if you want to know more information about it, please send me an email. I, that's it for me. Obviously, I'm happy to uh, take your questions later on after my colleagues uh, will finish their presentations. Thank you very much. Virtual. Next, we have Froso. You can um, share Okay, so good morning from me. So my name is Froso Argiri and I'm a lecturer at the UCL Institute of Education. I'm Roberto's uh, <laughs> colleague as well. So, and I'm also a co-founder and the director of UCL Bilingo, which is also involved in public engagement about bilingualism. So, um, let me... Um, okay, should be. Can you see it now? Yes. But just a minute because. Okay. So uh, today I will be talking to you briefly and kind to just follow up on what Roberto has already discussed. Uh, we're talking about recent research that we are currently involved in at the UCL Institute of Education. And, uh, and I will be talking more about how um, language literacy may interact with cognition and the brain in bilingual children. So I would like to start with uh, uh, the first uh, uh, research project, uh, which is an interdisciplinary code project. It's, an, it's a collaboration between linguists, uh, myself and Professor Li Wei, who are based at the UCL of Education, and neuroscientists, uh, uh, also UCL colleagues based in the Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. Uh, so uh, this project uh, has been funded by the Leverhulme Trust, and. Um, and the title of the project is Early Childhood Bilingualism Effects on Brain Structure and Function. So, and this is the scanner uh, you can see here that we used uh, for, for this study in the Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, so, um, the main question of this project is we want to see how, how does bilingualism influence the structure and function of the brain in childhood? So the main aim is to investigate whether uh, uh, being uh, bilingual uh, alters uh, um, functions such as what Roberto mentioned a while ago, uh, such as executive control, which are really cognitive processes that they're basing to our everyday life really, and uh, as well as language brain networks in children. Uh, so the participants of this study are English Greek bilingual children, both uh, are children who have acquired both languages from birth and children who acquired Greek first and English at a later stage. And these are, are uh, eight to 10 years old. And we also have a control group of English speaking monolingual children. This project is almost complete uh, and we are currently uh, looking at the findings. So um, we um, <clears throat> examined um, this particular uh, uh, brain networks uh, that um, we, we call executive control uh, brain networks that, as I said, these are uh, cognitive processes such as uh, attention or the ability to um, ignore in, in irrelevant in information. And we are also examining language brain networks. Uh, so here you can see uh, some examples just uh, just to show you what uh, these uh, images may be looking uh, like. So on the left hand side, you, this is that it's, it's a representation of the language network in the brain. And then uh, these uh, on the right hand side are examples of two uh, uh, of language tracts, as, as we say. So these are tracts in the brain that they are actually uh, uh, involved. Uh, with, uh, um, they're, they're just relevant to the language networks in the brain. Okay, so um, I don't know why, just a minute, this is. So as I said, this is uh, work in progress 
And uh, these are the following questions that we will be uh, um, investigating. Uh, so is the structure of language tracts different between bilingual and monolingual children? We want to see if there are any differences between the tracts that I showed you a, a while ago. Um, and we have um, included in the project simultaneous and successive bilingual children because we want to address the, the following questions. How does age of L2 acquisition influence language and executive control brain networks? Will simultaneous bilingual children show enhanced brain connectivity relative to successive bilingual children and the monolingual children? And what is the role of language use and language proficiency within the uh, uh, by, by bilingual group? So uh, will bilingual children that they seem to be using language, uh, you know, both their, their languages more frequently on a daily basis, and they also have a higher proficiency in their languages, will they, uh, will this uh, particular differences be important uh, for the language and executive control brain networks? Um, as I said, this is work in progress and um, okay, and we are uh, currently analyzing this data. So uh, the other project is focusing on literacy. Uh, one of the main questions, uh, one of the main concerns that parent, parents and educators have is whether and how bilingual children can acquire uh, literacy skills, reading and writing skills in both languages. Um, so what we know from research is that literacy in the heritage or the minority language, whatever you want to, to call it, can actually boost literacy in the school or the societal language. So we do in fact know that some reading skills can actually transfer across languages. This happens both for the alphabetic languages that we know more about, but there is recent research that shows that this can happen also uh, across languages that they have different writing systems. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the, um, uh, one piece of evidence of this kind of interaction between of transfer across languages is that uh, we may see that uh, some of the bilingual children may show a kind of earlier development, uh, an earlier understanding of the alphabetic principle, which is essentially this uh, uh, correspondence uh, between letters and sounds. Um, so uh, in this context, um, we have uh, uh, started uh, uh, this particular research project and the title is how does literacy experience in more than one language shape cognition and again an interdisciplinary project between uh, uh, psychologists and linguists um so uh, recent research uh, demonstrates that higher engagement in bilingual language environments uh, boosts some features of uh, of co cognition, like what we've talked about in the in the context of the previous research project, which is called executive control. So executive control, as I said before, uh, are skills, uh, executive control skills uh, are skills that are needed to manage cognitive resources during uh, tasks such as focusing attention and ignoring distractions. So uh, previous research has also um, found evidence of uh, uh, bilingual uh, um, advantage to working memory as well. Uh, most studies uh, that have explored the effects of uh, uh, bilingualism, uh, they have focused on examining mainly the uh, role of language cues and language proficiency without taking into account bilingual children's literacy experience in both languages which is a crucial aspect of bilingual development that actually requires acquiring, but also segregating uh, distinct uh, orthographic, phonological, and grammatical rules. So um, the, the current project then extends this kind of investigation to the role of biliteracy, of literacy, acquiring literacy in both languages, in how, and how this may shape co cognitive skills. So uh, we know that bilingual um, uh, uh, bilingual uh, speakers may differ with respect to language exposure and use, as well as the level of literacy in both languages. For example, here in the uh, in the UK, bilingual pupils in the UK are for the most part educated through uh, uh, English. 
So the normal, the, the formal development of, um, of literacy skills occurs only uh, or mainly in English. But literacy development in the minority or in the heritage language is not supported in mainstream schools. So uh, if we take all these things into consideration, there's likely significant variation in minority language literacy skills within bilingual school age children. Previous research suggests a strong relationship between level of language proficiency use and particular cognitive skills. So in this context, we try to examine whether individual differences in minority language literacy skills are associated with differences in cognitive abilities. So we aim to address the following question. I guess we are focusing again on English, Greek, bilingual children so that we keep this uh, you know, language variable stable. So the question is, do English, Greek, bilingual children with a higher level of biliteracy have better executive control and working memory abilities than English, Greek, bilinguals with a lower level of, of biliteracy. Again, this is work uh, in, in progress, and we hope to complete this project uh, uh, very soon. Okay, so finally, uh, we are also, um, like Roberto uh, explained a while ago, there is, we also run another network of, you know, that deals with uh, public engagement. Uh, so this is UCL Bilingo, which has or uh, originally been founded by myself, Professor Li Wei and Dr. Mel Mahon in, uh, at UCL. So what we've been doing for the last um, six years is that we are working closely with schools, with teachers, mm -hmm. with with pupils, with parents, and we try to bridge this gap between the researchers and educators and all the relevant, uh, um, uh, you know, individuals and uh, organizations that they're interested in multilingualism in childhood. So uh, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter as well. If you need more information uh, on this, please contact me as well. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. So it's our turn. Um, can you see my presentation here? Yeah. So, so yes. share it and um, excuse me. Right, back in the beginning. Um, so we have the third talk and um, of the theory, and it bears the same name as the session title, Growing Up by Lingual. Um, so basically it is actually the research project that started it all in a way. Um, so Leo, um, my PhD researcher here, and I basically started this project since 2018 um, with the funding from ESRC via the um, Youth Our Doctoral Training Program. And you listen to a lot about um, you know, potential benefits, or at least you know, impacts on outcomes um, for um, children growing up bilingual, and so our project specifically looked at, you know, where are there such a thing, and where where are such um, defects, um, potentially benefits, and especially we're interested in children that um, straddle across mainstream and so-called complementary language um, sectors that um, they will talk a little bit more about, and it was followed then by our funder series um, in which we actually met our lovely local presenters at this theory. Um, at this um, um, session, because we actually um, um, brought together researchers as well as practitioners alike. Okay, so firstly, the research project. Um, there are, um, say, threefold objectives. So, firstly, is indeed um, just like the others um, uh, aimed for. We try to ascertain whether there are any um, specific cognitive um, and also, in particular, social. Um, differences in the outcomes of bilingual children, and we looked at those children longitudinally over a couple of years. Cognitive um, outcomes can be um, directly linguistic, so we were looking at their language proficiency and both of the languages, that's English and the heritage language, okay, that they use with family. And also, some things can be um, experimentally tested, and they are shown some visuals. Um, to explain, such as um, the efficiency and accuracy of naming. Um, cognitive um, impact can also be non-linguistic, 
And so others have mentioned executive functions, so such as, you know, how good are children at shifting the focuses, but also attention and control. We also measure the outcomes of um, social identities, so their sense of affiliation, belonging to their ethnic heritage, but also to mainstream British identity as well. And we also look at social competencies that were basically reflected by um, their self-perceptions I mean, different areas and also peer competencies. And so I will therefore pass over to Leah to explain a bit more about this vision. Thank you. Um, yeah, Virginia already gave a very good overview, so I won't go into too much detail on the methodology, but just so you have an idea of sort of the various different tasks we did with um, bilingual children. So for executive functioning, we only looked at one particular part, um, task switching, which we used a card sort task for. Attentional control, we used kind of a standard flanker task, and both of these were on an iPad and um, sort of age controlled tasks. So it was quite interactive and good for our school sessions. We also looked at their English um, uh, word naming, particularly we looked at verbs and nouns, and this was across both time points. Um, and it's a cross linguistic task that has recently been developed. Uh, we also looked at their perceived social competencies, as Virginia mentioned, and these were um, using pictorial skills and also looked at their strength of identification in both their identities, British and heritage language. Um, apart from our key measures, we also had uh, important background measures. So, of course, we're looking at um, perceived proficiency and exposure in both languages, but also we wanted kind of an indicative measure of socioeconomic status. Uh, so we looked at uh, use the family affluence scale for that. So what that really told us was kind of their home environment um, and any differences between the communities in our sample. Uh, yeah, so moving forward. Yeah, the second main kind of research objective for us, which I'll go into now, was we wanted to compare children, bilingual children uh, growing up in the UK, particularly East London, uh, in these different outcomes. Um, and we had two groups, those that attend complementary language schoolings and those, uh, those that don't. Uh, so what that really means is bilinguals that had mo more exposure potentially to their heritage language and those that didn't. Uh, some of you may already know what complementary language schools are. Uh, there's many different terms for them. You might have heard supplementary school or Saturday school. We use the term complementary language school because um, all the schools in our project, which you can see here, uh, their logos, um, they all met specific uh, cultural, social and language needs, and they all had the same aim of preserving the heritage language of attendees, particularly second generation children. Um, they're very, very important kind of socio-political movement. Um, they've been around for a really long time in England, at least half a century. I think the estimate now is close to 5,000 around the UK. Despite this, they're quite under-recognized. Um, there is more recent research on them. And we know based on the recent research that actually they do a lot to engage parents um, and give students kind of a very positive positive environment uh, to develop their languages, but also their identities, particularly, as I mentioned, for second or further generation children who research shows might feel um, embarrassed about their uh, heritage language or try to conceal sort of that uh, heritage identity. Um, research has also shown that the wider community, uh, this helps also the wider community, not just attendees and parents, because uh, the wider community also ends up uh, respecting and uh, promoting bil bilingualism in different languages. There really is a need to kind of integrate mainstream and um, complementary sectors. Uh, this has been called for in other research. Um, and that's kind of what we also wanted to, to promote uh, through our project. Um, because they really do allow for kind of this positive identity formation. And they do a lot more than just uh, teach heritage language, as you can see from these photos. They do a lot uh, of em embedding the culture within their curriculum. And they're facing quite a lot of challenges, particularly recently with student retention and trying not to close down after, after COVID. Okay. So just very briefly, not going into technical details, what have we found? It wasn't designed this way. But it so happened that when we took data from children as baseline, that was the year before COVID lockdowns and so on. And so we actually had a pause in um, 2020, and then we followed them up in 2021 after all those lockdowns. So we have to keep that in mind, okay, as a backdrop. 
So what happened was a baseline point, at least when we're looking at the so-called balance of proficiency, where the children reported that they were equally fluent in both languages or whether one stronger than the other, we found that those that they had better balance also performed better on the executive function when they were shifting tasks. And then we talked about the subgroups. We found that those children that, yes, indeed, had the extra exposure at that point and reported higher um, heritage language proficiency. And important, regardless of the subgroups, we found that the stronger the proficiency, the stronger the relative, uh, the, the relevant identity as well. So stronger proficiencies, stronger overall identities, identification with both um, communities. And at that point, we found that um, most social competencies were associated with both languages. Um, but for those that didn't attend um, the extra setting, um, it's stronger for the English language. What happened after COVID was that something's changed, not least the sample, because a lot of the schools shut down um, for language learning, and some of those never reopened. And so the um, attendee, non attend difference in heritage language proficiency was no longer there. However, the um, association between balance and um, executive function in bil um, bilingualism still stands, okay? And still after COVID, both languages proficiencies are still associated with stronger identities. What keep, what would you could say a takeaway um, message after COVID is especially that at sample level, heritage language proficiency has dropped. Social competencies are to drop. And also compared to before, right now, social competencies are only associated with English proficiency. Okay. So I'll very quickly go through those and call back some time. Um, the third um, objective is, of course, um, public engagement, community engagement. And we've tried that already, you know, engaged communities even you know, before language show. So we've had papers and we have had um, parental engagement events in the day. Um, for the exhibition with other collaborators and so forth. Of course, the past and language show is through the um, our own seminar series that we met through um, our lovely co-presenters. And so we've basically looked at from language acquisition and maintenance of bilingual children um, through to what we've um, just briefly um, described as the outcomes um, of those children towards basically looking at a means for potentially optimizing capitalizing on this development. And we added on top also some collaborative projects building. And so these are the lovely people we've met, including a few of our colleagues that are actually speaking with us right now in this session. Um, and these are just some of those um, practitioner organizations that represent, they represent as well. And one of those we can see in the corner here is the Association for Language Learning that is represented by the president, um, Liz um, Black, that I'm gonna pass the baton to right now. Uh, good morning. Um, lovely to uh, to be here and support this work. Um, just a very brief introduction. This is a teacher's perspective now at the end of the sessions, and it's actually a personal and a professional one, because I was one of those children that Roberto and Frozo and Virginia and Leila have been talking about, that I grew up with a German mother who was told repeatedly, not just once, that if I uh, spoke German at home with her, I would be behind at school. So she didn't speak and it was a great disappointment. But later on, when I met my grandparents after six years of not seeing them because of the wall, I was so taken with the culture and everything that went with it that I hope I grew up to be a really dedicated head of languages. So I've been a head of languages and an advanced skills teacher in the North for many, many years. And I hope I've grown up to be a tall, strong tree like you can see in this photo here. Um, dedicated to helping the children and have many, many examples that I, as head of languages, have um, tried really hard to liaise with the parents. And that's come out very strongly in these presentations we've already had, how important it is to include the parents and indeed the com community as well. And that really pays off. So I've helped children, um, Arabic speakers, Urdu, Italian, Portuguese, languages like that to 
um, to get a GCSE to do their speaking exam. And I've really enjoyed that. And it's been very worthwhile and fulfilling. I live near Sheffield now, a very welcoming city, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I've been really, really impressed by the work of this project and the research and the aims um, to build this collaborative knowledge exchange. And like we've already heard, it's so important to exchange all these new ideas, the new research, so we can keep building, keep improving, and the research findings and many aspects of all the wider support I've heard in the seminars, Hackney and the EAL, the Richmond Friendship Group, which liaises with the community, and we see at ALL um, how important it is to share at our seminars. And you can see a photograph here with lots of uh, bilingual teachers there enjoying, and that's Rene in the background, our chair of board. We're absolutely delighted to be able to attend the Growing Up Bilingual seminars and learn from the detailed research. We, we are trying to bridge between that and, as I said, to, um, disseminate um, for the project and we'll continue doing that. I'll be president for two years now, and supporting the effective teaching of languages in multilingual Britain is the core aim that we all have, and this collaboration is just fantastic. Um, we all know children and have friends, and if you're at the languages show, I'm sure you have friends as well, with children growing up in bilingual, trilingual, multilingual families, and they deserve the best education that can be provided, and there's huge improvements. The collaboration is so important and to help bilingual children towards this optimum development that really must improve education. I feel we're a little bit of a turning point in Britain and I feel very positive about the future. So let's continue to work together and learn from each other and share and pool ideas. So we have started a new zone, the Home Heritage and Community Languages and ALL is a charity and it's run by teachers for teachers. And ALL volunteers are working with an informal group of others to offer support to teachers of a wide range of languages. And you can see this on our um, uh, website. It's interesting here, the language zones. And if you look for that one, you'll see what we're trying to do. Please do join ALL if you haven't. And if you email me, I can give you 10% off today. Um, <clears throat> Now, we are um, have a first webinar coming up on the 17th of November, um, and it's on motivation in the complementary school context. And as you can see, we are broadening out from the traditional offer, and um, we are um, the two speakers will speak about Arabic and Portuguese. So if you're interested in what's going on there and what we and this the, the main focus of this webinar is motivation. Also new at ALL are language stories. This is Stephen Fawkes, who works tirelessly for our um, association. And we like to encourage people to tell their story. I mentioned a very brief bit about my story. And at the age of 10, when I met my grandparents, I'd seen them once or twice before, but when I really got to know them, this is my story. Um, we aim to gather personal stories from language teachers, from the learners themselves. You may have some pupils and sick formers who have fascinating stories to tell. And the idea of this is to cheer people up and actually to inspire us all. So if you have a story to tell and you would like to share it, it doesn't need to be very long. Can you ask any of your colleagues, any pupils you know, any families you know, can they tell their story and send it to us? And there's the um, uh, email address, we would love to hear from you and add to this because I think um, podcasts, short clips, they are very moving. People from um, celebrities sharing, it really does inspire people to carry on with the language, with increase the uptake of GCSE and beyond. But it's also extremely moving to hear, hear from people and what's happened to them. And it's, it's important. ALL also produces regular publications such as the Languages Today magazine and the journals. We run training courses tailored to teachers' needs and we are open to suggestions from you. So please do get in touch with the ALL office if there is something that you'd like us to, to put on. Um, you can see our um, 
Language World Conference is in March, and we welcome contributions from um, speakers who um, are, have just started out on their journey or from teachers who've been um, teaching a long time to researchers, to educators. We want it to be open. Um, languages today, you can see that's the front cover of the most recent one. We focus on research, collaboration. And we really believe in reading, reflecting, and learning and adapting schemes of work, adapting our teaching with the aim of improving the life chances of children and students today. So you can see from the four presentations how closely, how, how we believe the same things and we're all working hard. So it's really a joy to be part of the, the um, and to hear from the project work um, that Roberto and Frozo and Virginia and Leila have all been working on and the other colleagues who've been there. It's really been a joy to me. Some things change. Research helps us to understand things more. Some things stay the same. Reading is really important and it doesn't matter really how you read. It could be on an iPad. You can see from this photo and um, in times gone by, people were looking down, waiting for public transport, looking down, reading their newspapers. Things have changed. But isn't it fantastic that we have access, such easy access to research from the wider world? and we can be part of this online seminar today. Fantastic, something's changed, something same, stay the same, but actually reading is really important and influences a lot um, our thinking. We need to adapt and move. I see myself as a lifelong learner and I'm sure all you do as well. Reflective practice is really important. During the Growing Up Bilingual seminars, we've been discussing building on the excellent work that's gone on before. Not everything needs to be new, but classroom practice can and should be built on and improved and extended. Resources can be pooled and adapted, so continual improvements are made. We're on social media as well, Twitter and Facebook, if you'd like to tweet a message. And Rennie here in the photo is a professor at Newcastle University, and his two lovely boys are being brought up bilingual. So we have just to finish with, um, the theme I've chosen for the um, Language World Conference next March is what we value, past, present and future treasure. There are many golden nuggets from the past that we can build on. There are, um, we need to look at the present situation and what's happening in the world as educators and so that we can build the best future chances for the children we all mix with. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm going to pass over to, um, pass back to um, Virginia because we can see there's quite a few questions. So do think about joining ALL and do get in touch with me personally. If you think there's anything we can do to so support you more, I'm very, very happy to support languages and to support you as teachers in any way that I can. And I see it as a volunteer role, but I'm really looking forward as president to see what changes we can make together. So let's work collaboratively. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, we have quite a few, um, we're looking in the um, Q&A, um, there's limited time and so, um, I have answered the few, and I think Roberto has already answered the few. So I, I, I have already answered the few, yes, the sent answer. So, but I don't know where these answers go. I thought that the answers would be stored somewhere, but yeah, some answers I did type. Um, if they're asking about content. Yeah, so, I was typing. Um, yeah, I've been typing yeah. some answers. But so. I think there's one. I think there are quite a few for Roberto, and some may actually um be kind of um cross lapping. Um, I think a key one is actually, and um, why disadvantaged children benefit from being bilingual, and that might also um, be, I, I have a feeling that might also um, debunk the research from 1941 that one of our listeners um, asked about what's wrong with that research. Yes, uh, do you want me to uh, explain this again? I, I, I answered the question on, on the... Okay, that's fine. But just, I mean, briefly, I, I just said that there were early research, in especially some papers, and I gave uh, the citation, uh, especially one paper by Sire 
in 1923 that reported that monolingual children outperformed bilingual children on measures of uh, IQ. Uh, these studies, uh, uh, however, they were flawed because they couldn't, they didn't really control for socioeconomic status. So basically the bilingual children were uh, from a poorer background compared to the monolinguals. And uh, in some cases, they didn't even understand the instructions of the test that they were given in English because their command of, the, of English was, was poor. So no wonder that the performance was uh, inferior to the monolinguals. But this generated a kind of belief that, uh, you know, uh, uh, raising children uh, in a bilingual environment would confuse their minds in some ways and delay cognitive development. And as I said to David, uh, there are of course other dimensions of this of the problem involving politics, uh, nationalism, uh, philosophical kind of uh, uh, roots that they they favor uh, uh, monolingual uh, education. But I'm not touching those dimensions because obviously this is not my field. Oh, thank yeah. you, um, there is uh, another question about EEL students. So can I type this on? I, I mean, if, if I type this answer, it will go. I don't know, Virginia, if you want to. They, they, they can look at the Bell Foundation. They have a yes, nice, and of right. course, uh, and of course. Uh, Nowadays uh, as well. Yeah. So I, I will put it there. Uh, not only, but I can put this, this, this link. Yeah. So that they can look because it's. Okay, so because this is based on yeah. the work by Victoria Murphy and Strand, obviously, who are the people who are uh, uh, actually um, reporting and they've been involved in this type of research for EL, for, for, for the performance of EL students in the UK. So Victoria Murphy, yeah. University of Oxford and uh, the Strand report. Yeah. It's the link, okay, I've sent it now. I think you can answer all. Yeah, participants can see the answered uh, questions yeah. in the task. Uh, can, can, can they? Okay, because I was thinking yeah, like... they want to have a look. <laughs> if anyone wants us to expand on anything as well, we can. But Is this in the chat, uh, Leia, or...? So in the Q&A, there's uh, three tabs on the top. Yeah. Um, uh, answered. Oh, okay, answered. So, okay. So people can see that, which is great. I'm, I'm just reflecting. If I could just add in one more comment before we finish I, I think that there's been a lot of interest in the chat that I think we need to involve head teachers as well we've yeah. talked a lot about parents and communities but leadership teams and I know in the past I've been told you're making a lot of extra work for yourself to do Urdu and Arabic and facilitate this and support them but the joy of the children is what's the most important thing isn't it and their futures um, and enabling things so I think we need to see how in the how we can, in the current situation in the future, facilitate um, more bilingual children having access and getting qualifications in their in their own in their heritage language. Yeah. So please do get in touch with ALL if you've got things to share. Um, we'll look forward to working with you. And thank you, Virginia and Frozen, Roberta and Leila. Wonderful thank work. You, Liz. I mean that most sincerely. Really wonderful work. Fantastic to be part of your project. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Great to have you. To have yeah. And we'll do our best to disseminate and share. So let's look for Language World even next year, the year after. We'll have a look and see if we can have a really good focus and have you all there. Oh, there, there is a lot in the chat now. Oh. I think there's some questions as well about um, access. Well, Just to reassure people, you will have the recording. Um, for about uh, three months, didn't they say that the recording will yeah. be available for yeah. about three months? So there's plenty of time for yeah. you to, uh, yes. And and Virginia, just you know, just just for all of us to say, if they want to follow up on any of what we've discussed or on the findings, because you yes. know, work in progress or other things, or the bilingual work or the bilingualist matters work, please uh, get in touch. We still meet, you know, as, as yeah. the, you know, this get in touch, still met, yeah. We you know, this, this group, you know, I don't know if they it. can find our email addresses. Were they on the first page of the presentation, uh, Virginia? Did, did, did we include any contact details there? 
Um, I don't know whether they include our contact details anyway, in okay. our biographies. You can um, Google us. <laughs> Yeah, mine I, is in my slides. My oh, it's email. in your slide. Oh, I, I slide. guess, and 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 mine is is on my slide. That that's a good point, Roberto. Yeah. I remember because now. I put yeah. it up. Even if not, you know, you type our name and our affiliation. Say, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Roehampton, you know, for UCL, and you yeah, it's fairly easy to to find out. But yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I guess we fielded everything. Or the question? Um, if not, I've just added into the chat the discount code. If anybody wants to, email, <laughs> we're, we're thrilled to have you as a group members, uh, all of you as group members of ALM. So if anybody else wants to join, if you use that code ALLPR10, it um, does work because um, yeah, I would have just um, used it. Discount. Really. Yeah. We're you have included together. us all, Virginia. Do we all have access to all Virginia? Yes. Or it's well, through, through me, so I will pass on everything. Because okay, I see. Okay, perfect. I only have six, I only got the membership on as of Wednesday, and yeah. I, I I can see that I've got a lot of emails oh. now. But okay, click this for that and that and that. So, yeah. so there are several questions here, but I don't know, are we going to finish? So is this the one of the supplementary schools that they struggle to motivate the students as they're sent to school by their parents and don't yet understand the benefits of them? Yeah, mm -hmm. it, 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 this is this is well known, you know, in my experience. I can relate well, to personally, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, this is well known. I mean, I've been working with several supplementary schools all these years and especially during after the age of 11, 12 years old. So best practices i think it comes down to parents to families you know when you, if you can get one of us in just to you know we will be happy to uh, you know just talk to uh, families and to and to parents about all these benefits and the importance of uh, maintaining the minority and, and the heritage language in my experience this has helped a lot so this is one of the tips that maybe you could uh, um see these if you could make a podcast, it could it's sustainable, isn't it? Then it's there. Exactly, it's exactly, Liz. A podcast, or we can, yeah. you know, or, or online or a podcast. It doesn't. And we could link it. that on our website. Exactly, so we could do that. This is a very good idea, Liz, actually, yeah. to just, uh, just list all the benefits of being bilingual, and this can be shared. It can be a shared resource. That's a very good idea, Liz. Um, there are more questions, so I don't know. When a French mother brought her child to school, I suggested she was with the infants for English literacy, but joined in all other classes such as maths, art, and music with her peers. This is the immersion, yeah? yeah. Virginia, they ask you, are you at Roy Hampton? No, she's, I, I just, she's, um, she's at yeah, Roy Hampton. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. I wonder if we actually have access to um, the chat and Q&A after the session as well, because if they, they have done the recording, I don't know if they also, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they, they have records, but I don't know if we can access that's all. And, and so, just to add one more thing onto the previous, it's just we've started doing work with the pupils per se, because <laughs> you see, these are the ones that they have to go to school every Saturday for three, four hours. So it's very important for the students, for the pupils to understand, you know, or at least to, to so that, that we try and and yeah. talk to them about all the benefits, uh, you know, and that actually that the work they put in every week it has, uh, you know, it's it's beneficial. Yeah. I think that's, sorry, a good point. Um, Claire also mentioned again in the chat that um, using other alumni, which I've seen other complementary school or supplementary schools do, so bringing previous students yes. in or having a bit of that dialogue with the actual students so they value what they're doing is very important. Yeah, yeah. but another very important aspect is talk to the mainstream school. Research yeah. shows yeah. repeatedly that when uh, bilingual children's heritage <laughs> language or minority language is being acknowledged, is yeah. being recognized at school, this yeah. has a very positive effect on the child's attitude, on the family's attitude, you know, on, of course, learning this language. So it's a kind of a... Yeah. I just, noticed, there, so. I just noticed what Gulen was saying. Some of the benefits, you know, if 
you know, we've got the sample, we've got the research, but, you know, some of those, that's the personal things, it may not happen straight away, but, you know, it's about patience and basically persistence because then, yeah, yeah it, it's, it, you know, it can take a few years before, you know, especially we do live in quite a, I would say, you know, relatively speaking, monolingual culture, you know, nationwide overall. But, you know, if you keep at it, it, it can happen, you know, and, and also be realistic about expectations. But um, I can say that, you know, with my children, the literacy actually has helped their speaking. And it's not something that I observed straight away. And I'm glad I kept, <laughs> kept them in heritage um, language school, especially through COVID and now going back to face to face. Um, because the literacy actually helps them make sense of the speaking and helps them with retaining their, their um, vocabulary, including spoken vocabulary. And it's something that, that may kind of reveal itself when they're actually older and kind of make the connections. And also when they kind of, you know, over time, it's, it's not so, you know, and they're not so translating, you know, it's not something, people can speak two languages, but actually to be very good at say, you know, being fluid between two languages is, it's not necessarily the case though, but it doesn't mean that, you know, that, that they're not bilingual. So that's something to keep in mind. Or it may be something, especially for children, that, that makes sense for them a bit later. That's what I've observed anyway. We yeah. have moved away from this now uh, currently in the linguistic, you know, when literature, when we talk about bilinguals or multilinguals, we have moved away from this notion of proficiency, yeah? Mm. So anyone who is actually using a language you know, on a daily basis. This is, you know, just being functional or barely or even yeah. passive. So it's it's not about, you know, being proficient. We have moved away from this kind of very stereotypical and very yeah. kind of strict definition. So it's it's not the the, the, the case. Uh, it's not the case. So yeah. Thank you. Great. We have one final comment, I think, in the QA about um someone's experience as well about identity yeah but yeah i think that's so about again the i think it's something that would that can take time it's something also that i children yeah it, 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 it's often i think one of our colleagues mentioned at one of our meetings i think it's Bali to say that when what we've shown research etc is quite often kind of a snapshot in time what the child is feeling or thinking at that point what they can do but you actually have to look at the kind of development over time. They can change their mind. You know, language can progress and regress and, and go back again. And yeah. So it, it's really, you know, in a way, a journey. Yeah, it's development. Yeah. Well, I think there are no more questions or comments. <laughs> If we have moved to other sessions, questions can produce more, you know, answers and then more questions than the other there. I think um, um, the the suggestion of older students looking back on their um, yeah. life is very powerful right. for that to be shared. Yeah. So it's inspirational. You know, yeah. Yeah. And if you know of any that could, could link to this to my story, those things can all be shared far and wide really to encourage parents who are, have got questions the pupils themselves sometimes have questions uh, don't they? I will get my daughter's story list definitely I yeah. will get my my daughter to write something but sometimes sometimes a sick former will look back or even a university yeah. student and look back and reflect very deeply and exactly. their personal story is really powerful and if we link that with the research yeah. and everything the more it's brilliant yeah definitely. I guess that, I'm glad you talked about you know you because most of the work is psychology as well to understand that you know as you get you know with age you know the reflective ability you know tends mm. to become stronger yeah um, Yes, there is another comment by Yoshito on the multiliteracy journey. Yeah, definitely literacy is very important as Virginia said and research shows that uh, as well, because you see with reading, uh, children are actually exposed to more complex syntactic structures and to vocabulary that you are unlikely to just use when you talk to them or syntactic structures like, I don't know, uh, sentences, you know, longer sentences and more formal vo vocabulary. So this helps with maintenance of the language. So of course, it increases and maximizes the, the child's access to reading material, to newspapers, news, you know, to all sorts of different venues, you know, and context that they re require a more advanced 
uh, vocabulary. So reading does help a lot, definitely. So it's not enough to be bilingual, as we say. This is the message of of the new project that that we are actually working on. It's to be biliterate as well. It's a very important aspect. Yes, comic books as well, everything. I yeah. know that there is a challenge there because uh, when we have, when our, our children, for example, do not have the vocabulary, yeah. for example, it's very difficult, it's very challenging. I get this this question a lot in the, in the workshops I run with parents or teachers. So which books should we buy for the child? Because you see, if the vocabulary is for, um, I don't know, for a six year old, seven year old, and the child is 11 year old. So the thematic, you know, which theme should you choose? It can be prob pr problematic. It may be very simplistic, but many countries now I'm aware and many institutions, they try, they just produce such kind of bilingual books or, uh, you know, different books with different levels. Uh, so maybe people can actually, parents, uh, look at these options. But it's a challenging aspect, definitely. Yeah, it's finding the, you know, the appropriate book for a material. For an older uh, child, you see, for, for a 12 year old, let's say an older child with, with a monolingual child, this, this is suitable. But for a bilingual child that the vocabulary is not as advanced, it could be very challenging. And, and, the, and the child is getting, you know, fr frustrated at the end of the day. Yes, they cannot so, so access. Some, lang some languages, I suppose, it could depend on popularity of the language well, and also outside well, learners because some, in general this is the that, challenge um, yeah it's a some, challenge some some seem to have more resources than others and yeah exactly it's, it's yes. worth looking, looking yeah, yeah, yeah definitely definitely them. definitely yeah. yes and people are are more aware of this challenge lately and they produce such books for the multilingual learners we covered all I'm also looking at chat now. There's no more new questions. So I think um, we can wrap up. <laughs> Thanks for staying um, beyond as well, those who are still around. Um, yeah, you can feel free to get in touch um, with us. You know, the, uh, you know, the speakers here and then um, we've given, you know, the contact details and um, codes and all that. Um, yeah, and I, you know, as some um, processes in which you can easily Google with names and um, institutions. And of course, through the recording that you're gonna receive if you're registering, you can get the recording for the next three months, then you can basically find out our, um, more about us as well. Okay, and about this, this program of events that have taken place. I've, I've put the link somewhere actually of um, reports about our <laughs> seminars, because we've also recorded our um, previous seminars. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshito and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. you for your attention you and, and for your time. Everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.